In Phoenix 5.0, we released Auth, which is a highly sought after feature. And today, I'm gonna to give you a short demo of what it looks like to deploy Phoenix with Auth, um, how to create users, how to create API keys, and how to administer a system with authentication. To start out, I'm here on the command line, and I'm gonna go ahead and launch Phoenix as I would normally do, using this command Phoenix serve, which we introduced in version 5.2 little bit of syntactic sugar, so check it out. And you'll notice that Phoenix launches as, as normal, and if I go to the home page, I'm able to see my traces and my projects and my data sets, everything is normal. So the first thing that I wanna point out about the way we've designed auth is that it's entirely opt-in. If you don't ask and configure your system to use auth, uh, you're not gonna get auth. Um, so Phoenix will work just as it did before. But if you do want to use auth, what you can do is you can set a couple of new environment variables. So I've got a file here in which I've stored a few of these environment variables. So the first environment variables that we're going to set are going to be Phoenix enable auth, which we'll set to true, and the Phoenix secret, which is going to be used to sign all of those API keys that we're going to issue and sign the tokens that are used for managing sessions. So let's go ahead and source that file so that we get those environment variables. So now I've got these environment variables here in my environment. And I'm gonna go ahead and relaunch Phoenix. And this time, when I hit the Phoenix homepage, instead of just being directed right into Phoenix, I'm actually going to hit this login page. And since this is the very first time that this instance of Phoenix has been deployed with authentication, I need to first log in with the default admin account, which has a default password of admin. So I'll go ahead and log in. And I am immediately prompted to change my password. So I will do that. I will change my password to the highly insecure password of password. And I'll go ahead and log in. So admin at localhost and password, password. And now I'm logged in. And so at this point, I'm able to see my projects. I'm able to see my traces my data sets, everything um, as before. The thing that you'll notice that's different though is if I come down here to the bottom left corner, I've got a couple of new pages I can access. The first new page is the profile page. So here I can see my user's profile. I can see my username of admin, my email. I can change my username if I want. So maybe instead of being admin, I wanna be cool admin. I can do that and now my profile has been updated. I could reset my password. Um, I won't demo that. Um, and the other thing you'll notice on this page is also this section called API keys, which are going to show my user API keys, which we're going to discuss in a moment. Uh, the other page that's a little different when you're running with auth is the settings page. Now, because I am an admin, uh, I've got two additional sections down here that I can see. I've got system keys on the one hand and I've got user keys. So these are the two kinds of API keys that we're gonna be dealing with. You can see not, none of them are actually created in this particular instance of Phoenix yet, but we'll create one. And I'm also able to see all of the different users of this particular instance of Phoenix. In this case, there's only the one user right now, me. What are the kinds of users that you can create? And what are the kinds of API keys that you can create? Let's talk about that. So we've already kind of gotten an introduction to admins. Admins have more power in the system. They can manage other users, create, delete, update other users. Um, they're also able to manage system and user API keys, regardless of whether or not they were the ones who created those keys. And we're going to talk about the difference between those two kinds of keys in just a moment. Um, members, on the other hand, are only able to manage their own profile. So they can change, for example, their own username they can change their own password, but they can't change other people's usernames or other people's passwords. And members can manage their own user API keys, but they can't create system API keys and they can't create or delete um, other users' user API keys. So now let's kind of talk about this distinction that I've been alluding to, this distinction between user API keys on the one hand and system API keys on the other. So user API keys are, as the name suggests, going to represent the action of a particular user. 
and they're tied to the user who creates them so that if that user is deleted, the user API key also is automatically deleted. And the case where you're going to use a user API key is going to be in situations where you know, a user is kind of like in the loop. For example, if somebody is running an experiment in a notebook, that's a situation where they are interacting programmatically with the Phoenix APIs, and we want to have an API key that represents that kind of action. Now, system API keys, on the other hand, are representing not any individual user, but rather the system as a whole. And they're not tied to any individual user. So even if the user who creates the system API key uh, is deleted or leaves, um, that system API key is going to continue to exist. And the situations where you might use a system API key would be if you have some kind of like automatic process that's interacting with the Phoenix APIs, for example, if you have something running in CI, that would be a good situation where you want to use a system API key. So let's go ahead and see what some of these concepts look like in practice. As an admin, I am able to add other users. So I will go ahead and do that. I will add a user and I'm able to enter their email address. I'm able to choose a username for them and I can choose a password. And I'm also able to choose what kind of role they have. So we've already seen, you know, admin users. I've already shown you what that looks like. Let's go ahead and choose the role of member for this user going to add the user and you can see this newly created user down here in the users table and uh, you know in addition to um, creating this user I could if I wanted to delete the user I could reset their password I could change their role so I could turn this user into an admin um, but I won't do any of that for this demo what I'll actually do is I will just log out of my current admin account and I will then log in as this newly created member user. And I think I remember the password I used. Uh, immediately upon login, I'm going to be prompted to create a new password, which I will do. Reset the password, and then I will log in with this newly reset password. And now I'm logged in as a member user into Phoenix. And if you come down, You'll once again see I've got a profile. I've got my username, I've got my email, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the thing that's different is you'll notice if I come to the settings page, I'm no longer able to view all of the system and user API keys for this instance of Phoenix. And I'm also not able to see any other users of Phoenix. Um, so again, admins have that privilege, member users do not. So let's Let's actually see what we can do as a member user. So let's suppose that I'm a member user and I want to interact programmatically with the Phoenix API. In order to do that, um, I'm going to open up a notebook. This is our data sets and experiments quick start. And if I were running Phoenix without authentication, I would just be able to run this notebook and it would just run. So let's go ahead and try that. And you'll see on the very first cell, I'm already getting an error here. I'm getting a 401 unauthorized because my um, instance of Phoenix is authenticated. It's secured. Um, so if I want to run this notebook against an authenticated instance of Phoenix, what I need to do as a member user is I come into the profile page and I create a new user key. So I'll go ahead and name this API key. I will call it my um, experiment key. And I have the option of putting in a description. So I will say uh, a key to run experiments in a notebook. And I also have the option to choose an expiry. If you don't choose this expiry, the key will never expire. I'm going to go ahead and create that key. And you can see here, here's the newly issued API key, which is actually issued in the form of a JWT. And in my notebook, I am then able to add um, a single line of code. I will import OS and I will set an environment variable. That environment variable is Phoenix API key, which I will then set to my newly created API key. Let's go ahead and run all. all right. And so now you're able to see that I'm getting a bunch of green check marks. It looks like my notebook is running. If I come all the way down to the bottom, it's run successfully. 
and I can click through on this link and there it is. There is my experiment showing up in an authenticated instance of Phoenix. So that is how you interact programmatically um, with the Phoenix API when it's authenticated. Now, suppose that you forgot your password, right? Um, as you've seen, admin users have the ability to reset passwords for other users. So if you are a member user and you have forgotten your password, the easiest thing that you can do is just ask an admin user on your team to reset your password for you. You can also configure SMTP relays in order to get password reset via email. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like. I'm going to go back to my environment variable file. And I'm going to add a couple more environment variables. So the environment variables that I'm adding here are the host name, the port, the username, the password um, for an SMTP relay. I will go ahead and add that. And I will add those environment variables. And then I will redeploy Phoenix. Cool, so now Phoenix has been redeployed. I'm gonna go ahead and click on forgot my password. And I'll go ahead and enter my email associated with my account. And I will send that password reset email. And now if I go to my email, it might take a minute, but it looks like it's already here. I've gotten this email with a password reset link, which I can follow. And then I'm able to reset my password in the UI. So I will choose a new password. reset, and then I'll log back in with that new password. All right, so that's how SMTP relays work. And just to drive home this distinction between user API keys and system API keys, I'll go ahead and log back in as an admin. And I'll go ahead and take a look at this user key. So here we've got the user API key that was created not by this current admin that I'm logged in as, but by the member user that we created a minute ago. And if I go ahead and delete this member user and I refresh the page, what you'll notice is that actually that user API key also disappeared. So once again, those user API keys are tied to the user who creates them. In contrast, if I had created a system API key, it would still be here even if that user who created it was deleted. Now, the last thing I want to show you is the OAuth 2 integrations that we have with Phoenix. Just as a little bit of context here, OAuth 2 is an open standard that allows um, an application like Phoenix to delegate authentication to a third-party service, which is known as an IDP or identity provider, so that it doesn't have to store credentials itself or actually verify that the user is who they say they are. OpenID Connect is an extension of OAuth 2 that provides authorization in addition to authentication. In particular, it provides information such as the user's email, their profile picture, um, and other kinds of information that we then use to construct the user's profile. And Phoenix is going to be able to integrate with any IDP that supports OpenID Connect and that has a particular kind of server metadata URL, which I'll show you in a minute. So supported IP IDPs include uh, Google, AWS Cognito, Microsoft Entra ID, Auth0, and any other that supports OpenID Connect. So let's take a look at what it actually looks like to configure an OAuth provider with Phoenix. To do that, I'm going to go once again and return to my environment variables. And I'm going to add all of these environment variables here. So this is actually multiple different IDPs. And you'll be able to see um, the settings that are actually required in order to add an OAuth IDP. There's three settings for each IDP. The first one being the client ID, second one being the client secret, and the third one being um, the OpenID Connect configuration URL. So the, the client ID and the client secret are going to be generated by the IDP when you register your application. And you're then going to add those environment variables here. And the OpenID configuration URL is a configuration URL that you need to find for your IDP. I can show you what the one for Google looks like. Um, so if we open this URL in the browser, all it is is a JSON payload that describes metadata about the authorization server that we're dealing with. So it describes information such as the token endpoint 
um, or, or the redirect URI that you use when you're doing the OAuth2 authorization code flow. So as long as your um, IDP supports OAuth2 and supports OpenID Connect and has this well-known OpenID config URL, uh, you should be good to go. So I will go ahead and activate Phoenix with those environment variables. So let's go ahead and spin it back up. And now if I come back to the home page, in addition to that email and password field that you saw before, now I'm also seeing these login buttons for these different IDPs. And I've got Auth0, AWS Cognito, Google, Microsoft Enter ID all showing up here. You know, in practice, you probably are only going to configure one or two at most. Um, but let's go ahead and see what this looks like when I log into Google. I'm going to go ahead and click on the login button. And the first thing that happens is I actually get redirected to the IDP. So I get redirected to Google and I'm then able to sign in with my Gmail account, which I will do. When I reach this page, Google is actually asking me for permission to share certain pieces of information with Phoenix, in particular my name, my email address, and my profile picture, which we use to construct your profile in Phoenix. So I'm going to go ahead and accept that. And then I'm redirected back to Phoenix, and if I come to my profile page, you can now see my newly created um, user, which has my email, it has my username, uh, and it also has my profile picture from my Gmail account. So that's about everything I wanted to show you today. Um, really excited to release this feature to the community. Definitely try it out. Let us know how it goes. And I didn't even cover everything that we've built today. We have additional security features like secure cookies and CSRF protection. So go ahead and check out the documentation linked below um, and give it a try.